started out to do. I graduated from seminary in 1979, taught school for a couple of years, and then got involved uh, with a ministry called American Vision. And uh, the first series of, of books I wrote was the, the God and Government series, which was a, came out in 1982, 1984, 1986. And that, if you remember, uh, that was the height of the, the Reagan Revolution. And the goal in those books was to help Christians understand how government works and that government was not synonymous with, with politics. And that, that series did very, very well. And, but invariably, I'd go out and speak on that topic, and I would find people who would raise their hand and say, but Mr. DeMar, Mr. DeMar, we're living in the last days. Jesus is coming soon. Uh, why are we bothering with, with politics and economics and things of that sort? Now, remember, the, this is 1980s. And in 1970, Hal Lindsey had written a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And in that book, he made something of a prediction. He wasn't the only one to make this, this math uh, connection. Uh, Chuck Smith did it, uh, Dave Hunt and others had done it, and uh, Israel becoming a nation again in 1948 was to them prophetically significant, and it was based upon the fig tree of Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, where Jesus says, when you see uh, leaves on, on the fig tree, etc., and uh, Luke says, when you see tree, um, leaves on all the trees, but Hal Lindsey said that was Israel becoming a nation again, and others had made the same kind of prediction. Then he went on to say in Matthew 24, 34, uh, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So you have verse 32 about Israel becoming a nation again. And verse 34, this generation will not pass away. And for them, this generation referred to the generation that would see Israel becoming a nation again. And that generation was said to be 40 years. And so the math was pretty simple. 1948 plus 40 gave you 1988. So there was this great anticipation in the 1980s that the rapture was going to come, was going to be soon. It would have to be sometime between 1981 and 1988. And Chuck Smith actually kind of made that prediction. I think one of the, I don't know if it was the hale Bop comet that had passed through in 1981. I can't remember which one it was. It made some, uh, some calculations based upon that. And I think it was Revelation chapter 6 uh, that he said that this was a fulfillment. And, and so this, this was a big, this was a big, big deal. Uh, this was before Left Behind, the Left Behind series in, 19, in the late 1990s. Uh, but there was this anticipation. And so uh, I was dealing with this in, a, in some articles and I sent it to uh, uh, Robert Wolgamuth and Mike Hyde. I, I knew Mike Hyde, he was at um, Thomas Nelson for a while. And then he, he and Robert Wolgamuth started a, a company called Wolgamuth and Hyatt. And they published the first edition of Last Day's Madness. Uh, they also published some of uh, George Grant's books. They published some of uh, David, I think they published a, a book that David Chilton had done. They were just, they were, it's kind of funny, they were just getting off the ground and they were desperate to publish anything that they could. And they took, they published our stuff, which we were very thankful for. Um, and uh, uh, Mike Hyde eventually went on to become president of Thomas Nelson, and I wrote a book in response to the Left Behind series called End Times Fiction. And so this idea of the application of Bible prophecy to the world in which we live and the implications of that was what got me interested in the topic. I, I thought this needed to be answered. And when I was in seminary, I had, written, I had uh, gotten a book called Matthew 24, that was, a simple, that was the simple title of the book by Marcellus Kick. And it had been initially published in 1948, a uh, very, very small book. I have some original copies of it. Uh, and when I read that book, it really transformed my thinking about not just Bible prophecy, but it transformed my thinking about hermeneutics, the science and the art of interpretation. And uh, because what Kick did was to uh, compare scripture with scripture. His arguments weren't a lot like Lorraine Bentner's uh, articles, but many of them were, were statistics and, cult and cultural things and so forth. Um, and I don't even know if Bentner actually did anything on Matthew chapter 24. Uh, there was very, very little that I had read on Matthew tw chapter 24 that made any sense to me. I had read William Hendrickson's commentary in Matthew 24 and I was completely befuddled by it. It didn't, it didn't really do a good job at all. But Marcellus Kick's book really transformed my thinking. 
So in the early 80s, when I was doing the God and government thing, and we was challenged on uh, the, the consequences of eschatology related to culture and the rapture and all that kind of thing, uh, I sat down and because of some articles I had written, uh, I ended up writing The Last Day's Madness. And, you know, I've, uh, Ken Gentry and I, have, probably from the reform perspective, uh, have, have been the ones who have kind of led the way in, 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 this, in this topic. And anytime there's, you know, something happens in the world, an earthquake, a, a, a tsunami, uh, and what we're, fi we're finding right now with, with the virus, immediately the prophetic speculators, you know, come out and they start speculating about Bible prophecy. They did the same thing with the blood moon things, if you remember, just a couple of years ago. And I've seen all this before. There's, there isn't anything new about what we're seeing today. It's unfortunate, however, that what, we, what we've got are generations of Christians uh, who have no idea of the history of all this prophetic speculation. And so it, it was I felt it was necessary to do the exegetical work in this area. And that's what Last Day's Madness was, was to deal with a lot of these arguments. And uh, there has been a, uh, a monumental change in uh, prophecy today. I mean, I, I used to do radio uh, shows, and I would get blasted on these radio shows. And in fact, I did a three-night, three hours each night on a California radio station, and people just called in and asked questions. And it was a, it was a lot of fun for me. And but the and that was kind of like 75% negative and 25% positive. Well, subsequent to that, I've been on some shows where uh, I don't get anything negative anymore. It's everybody in, think, you know, I, I, used to, I used to believe this when I was reading scripture. Uh, I came to, I've come to the same conclusions or someone says, Gary, I've read your book or Ken Gentry's book. And, uh, and so the, there's been a significant shift in the area of, of politics uh, and the position that I hold, which is not a new position at all, there's really nothing new about it. I've just repackaged it. Uh, th there, are lots of, there are more and more people out there who are beginning to embrace a, a partial preterist perspective on Bible prophecy, which has its roots all the way back, if you're gonna trace it historically, probably to the fourth century in Eusebius, uh, but I, I, have a, I have a library full of books. It's amazing how many of them, at least on the book, at least on the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, that Jesus is dealing there with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. John Owen, John Lightfoot, Adam Clark, uh, Henry Hammond. It, it's amazing the number of books that are out there that, that deal with that particular perspective. So, uh, What's, what's happened with this is to, is to kind of lead people out of dispensationalism and what is the most effective way to do that? What, does the, what is the Bible's method of dealing with all of this? And, and I, I have just a couple of principles that I hold to. I, the first principle is let the Bible interpret itself. Um, I, I did a, a two hour interview uh, similar to this in, in Australia about two weeks ago. And I, I kept reiterating, I said, you noticed I haven't quoted anyone. I haven't used any historical sources. I said a couple of them when it dealt with earthquakes and famines and so forth. Uh, I said, this is just, this is pure Bible, just using the Bible, interpret the Bible. And you don't need any fancy charts. It's not very complicated. You take the Bible seriously. You see how the Bible uses a particular word or phrase over here, see how it's being used over there. And from that, you, you come up with a perspective that's, that's pretty simple. Uh, so the, the first one is, is using the Bible to interpret itself. Uh, and we think, well, everybody does that. Well, not everybody does do it. I was on Facebook today, and uh, was, somebody had commented on one of my articles, and she talked about, well, you know, the Bible teaches uh, that the Antichrist will appear during the seven-year period when the, when the temple is going to be rebuilt uh, and animal sacrifices are going to be reinstituted and the covenant is going to be made with Israel and then that covenant is going to be broken, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just, I commented and said, where does the Bible say any of that? 
And see, people have, you know, if you look at the Matthew's gospel, you know, Jesus talks about, you've heard it said, or you've, you've heard it was written. Uh, but when you go back and actually look at what the text says, it, the text doesn't really say what the people claimed it said that you hear something over and over again for the longest time and you end up with, uh, with well, why would anybody lie to me about this? Why would anybody make, make these things up? Another thing she talked about the seven year period that the book of Revelation talks about, and it's, it's fascinating. You don't find the word antichrist in the, book, in, in the book of Revelation. A lot of people are surprised by that. Uh, the book of Revelation from chapter four through chapter 19 is supposed to be about a seven year tribulation period or a seven year period. And yet, while the number seven appears all through the book of Revelation, seven years does not. Uh, and then you ask people, where do, they get, where do they get the seven years from? Where does this seven years come from? And it comes from Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And it's, it's, it's literally broken off from the first 69 weeks of years. And a gap is inserted at the end of 69 weeks. And then the 70th week is pushed into the future. And then what starts that 70th, that 70th week, that's the final seven years, is supposedly the rapture of the church. And yet if you were to go back into um, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, there's no mention of an antichrist. There's no mention of a gap. There's no mention of making a covenant with Israel. There's no mention of breaking a covenant with Israel. Now, you would think that when people are, are hit with that reality that they would say, well, wow, I never knew that before. But it's amazing the extent that people go to in order to hold on to their prophetic position because I think they, they, they believe if they're wrong about this, what else are they wrong about? So again, the first, the first principle is, in fact, uh, you have to let Scripture interpret itself. And sometimes that's not an easy thing to do because uh, Jesus makes some some rather dramatic statements about sun, moon, and stars, and and a, a great tribulation, and the gospel being preached in the whole world, and and, and so forth. And the Book of Revelation uh, uh, talks about you know, uh, uh, you know, the mark of the beast, uh, the name of the mark, etc. Et you know, buying and selling, and then to say, well, are you telling me that those things were in fact fulfilled already? And I say, well, yes, they have. And so, well, how can you say that? How in the world could the gospel have been preached in the whole world before that generation passed away? And I always ask people, I said, what would convince you that the gospel had in fact been preached to the whole world before that particular generation passed away? And uh, a lot of them kind of said, well, I'm not real sure. And I said, well, the only thing that would convince me is if the Bible actually said the, the gospel had been preached in the whole world before that generation passed away. And then when you say that, you say, well, you can't, you don't tell me that, that the Bible actually says the gospel had been preached the whole world before that generation passed away. And I said, yes, I'm telling you that. And so when you show them, it's amazing the reaction you get is people say, I've never, I've never heard that before. But all you have to do is look at a couple of passages, Colossians 1.6, Colossians 1.23, Romans 1.8, uh, I, I did a debate with uh, Thomas Ice. I actually did nine debates with him. And in one of the debates with him, he said, Gary, you're right. Uh, uh, the, 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 the word that's used there in Matthew chapter 24, 14, and this is the, the, second, the second principle I always talk about is you have to pay attention to the words and how they are translated. And sometimes this means having to go behind the English translation and actually get to the original languages. And this is unfortunate for a lot of people. They don't like to do that. Um, you remember when I was down in uh, um, with uh, Kent Hoven and debated Kent Hoven. Uh, he, does, he does not like using uh, uh, Greek. You know, oh, no, don't. We, you know, we, we're not, we don't have to use the Greek. The King James Bible, the way it's translated, is good enough. And look, King James translators were human beings. They weren't inspired by God. It's a great translation, but there's some things in it that could be translated better. I wouldn't say that the translation is an error, but it's, it could be translated better. And so the, the second principle is, I said, you got it. Sometimes you have to get behind what some of the words are that are being used and say, Matthew chapter 24, verse three, uh, it talks about the end of the age. 
Now, if you look at the King James Version, you'll see that it says the end of the world. And if you get to Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, it says this gospel, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in the whole world uh, to all the nations. And uh, it really didn't come up that much in that debate with Ken Hovind. He really didn't offer much resistance when I did bring it up, which was, I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, but translations are extremely important. I think more modern translations might have some footnotes. In fact, if you look at, at your Bible, if you have your Bibles with you, it would be interesting to see uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, and see what your translation says, and look at Matthew 24, verse 14, and see what your translation says, and look at Luke 2, 1, and see what your translation says. And sometimes they'll give you a little marginal note. Uh, that'll, that'll explain what literally what is what is being said here. Now let me just give you an example. Matthew chapter 24 verse 3, um, they ask about the end of the age. Now the King James and other translations have the end of the world, but you would expect the Greek word cosmos to be there, like for God so loved the world, cosmos, but it isn't. It's the Greek word aeon and it refers to a period of time. Uh, and if you get to Matthew chapter 24, 14, uh, it says the gospel must be preached in the whole world, but the, world, the word that's used there is neither aeon or uh, cosmos. It's a completely different word. It's the only time Matthew uses it, and it is oikumene. It's the same Greek word that's used in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, where it says a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world be taxed. Well, I'm sure the, the, the Caesars would have loved to have taxed the whole wide world if they could, but they couldn't. And so Luke picks a very particular world, uh, word, and that, that word is oikumene, that is the political boundaries of that era, the inhabited earth, the known world, oikumene. Uh, if you know a little bit of Greek, you'll see that the, the, the first part of that is, comes from the, the Greek word house or oikos for house. We get the word economics. From that, that is the 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 uh, lawful the nomos the the lawful ordering of a household. So the oikunami the the uh, ukumene refers to the political boundaries at that particular period of time. Well, that changes everything. Jesus isn't talking about the end of the world in verse three in Matthew twenty-four, and he's not talking about that the gospel will in fact be preached in the whole wide world. All it had had to be preached in is throughout. The, the Roman Empire. And that's exactly what, what uh, Paul says in Romans 1 8. In fact, in, in Romans 1 8, uh, he actually uses the word cosmos, that the gospel has been, you know, the gospel has been known you know, throughout the world. Uh, Colossians 1 1 6 uh, talks about that as well. And you get to Colossians 1 23, it talks about how the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven. Now, this is this is the kind of the third principle you have to come to, and that is you have to allow the Bible uh, to interpret itself in terms of its literature. Uh, R.C. Sproul wrote a, a great little book on hermeneutics called uh, Knowing, Knowing Scripture. And the definition he gives to literal uh, is according to the literature. And so, you know, there are metaphors and similes, uh, uh, there are rhetorical questions. There are all kinds of figures of, of, of speech that are used, and hyperbole is is one of them. We use it all the time. We use it all the time. I just used it there. We use it all the time. But we all we all know that uh, all the time doesn't mean every single time. And uh, we and when I say we all know, it's not everybody in the whole wide world. It's just that the word is used as hyperbole that we understand. And the Bible uses the, that same kind of language. And uh, the, the, one, the third, one of the third uh, points I, I use is in learning to interpret scripture with scripture, uh, that oftentimes the best interpreter of scripture is the Old Testament. Uh, and the, when, when Jesus quotes the Old Testament, or makes allusions to the Old Testament uh, in the in the New Testament. Your, the best thing to do is to go back to the Old Testament and see how that how that was used there. Um, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, if any of you know Kirk Cameron, 
uh, Kirk Cameron uh, was on growing pains. Um, he was a, a, an atheist for the longest time. He became a Christian and uh, pretty, pretty prominent. In fact, he was on Fox News, uh, I think, uh, last week. And we have a mutual friend, Marshall Foster. Uh, again, I don't know if you know who Marshall is. Marshall's been around for as long as I have been doing this. He centers mostly on, on America's Christian history. And he got to be good friends with Kirk and did a, um, a, uh, uh, a movie with him that came out uh, not too long ago. And uh, Marshall is a post-millennialist. And he said, uh, he, he, he said, Kirk, I want you to watch this video series by a friend of mine. It was, it, was, it was mine. And each lesson was like 20 minutes long, 20 or 30 minutes. And Kirk would put in each one of those DVDs and listen to it and watch it. And when he did that, he would say, you know, well, that makes sense. You know, that makes sense. I, I, okay, I go along with that. Then he got the verses 28 and 29. So all the way up through 29, Kirk was agreeing with me that I had made my case. Then he got the verse, verse 29, and verse 29 talks about the sun, moon, and stars. Uh, sun going dark, the moon going dark, and the stars falling. And before he put the next DVD in, he, he said, there is no way that Gary DeMar can convince me that that was fulfilled before that generation passed away. Well, he put it in, he watched it, and he was convinced. And it, that, he, that was transformational for him as well. Now, what convinced him? It wasn't my persuasiveness. It was just I appealed to the Bible. Uh, comparing scripture with scripture, letting the Bible speak for itself, and uh, comparing scripture with other scripture passages using the Old Testament as the standard if Jesus or some of the, in some of the uh, apostles quoted the Old Testament. So I took him back to the Old Testament, and I first thing I did, I took him to uh, Genesis chapter 37, and Genesis chapter 37, there is the, the, the dream that Joseph had about the sun, moon, and 11 stars bowing down to him. And they represented his father, his mother, and his 11 brothers. So in, in essence, sun, moon, and stars represented Israel at that, at that context because sun, moon, and stars represent nations elsewhere in the Bible. And if you look at, for example, uh, Isaiah chapter 13, uh, sun, moon, sun, moon, and stars is used there to describe Babylon, and you see the sun and the moon going dark. Well, Jesus takes the Babylonian language and, and uses it in Matthew chapter uh, 24, verse 29, and he applies it to Israel. And so, in, in, in essence, Israel becomes the New Testament Babylon. And there are some who even maintain, I know Ken Gentry does in the book of Revelation, that Babylon isn't isn't Rome, but it's actually it's actually Jerusalem. It's the it's the it's the place where Jesus was crucified. Where in, in um, I think it's Revelation chapter eleven, uh, Jerusalem is described as uh, Sodom and Egypt. So you see in the New Testament that uh, Israel is identified with a lot of these pagan pagan nations. Uh, and, uh, and also you'll find in M Matthew chapter 24 uh, that they are to flee uh, to, you know, to the mountains. And Luke, Luke is, actually makes reference to, to uh, Lot and his wife fleeing. So as you see all the, these Old Testament allusions uh, coming in. And also, you, you can't go from, from verse 28, Matthew chapter 24 to 28, and then, and then put a gap between the 20, 28 and verse 29, because verse 29 begins with immediately after the tribulation of those days. And so if, you, if this takes you all the way up to verse 28, and that refers to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, immediately after means immediately after, not a gap of 2,000 years. So when you, when you look at the, when you, when you make your comparisons with the old, with the Old Testament related to these particular prophecies and how Jesus uses those, and other New Testament writers use those, it's, it's very clear that Jesus is borrowing that language as kind of a prophetic shorthand to uh, make his point. All these things are going to happen before that generation passed away. That, 
That's what verse 34 says. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And then the next, the, the next point I make is, is that you've got to pay close attention to the text as to what's being dealt with. And I had mentioned earlier about uh, if you, in, 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 the, in the timing, the timing of things and the geography of things to, exp to help set where, what a, pro a prophecy is talking about. In Matthew chapter 24, uh, Jesus gives us in, in instructions about uh, when you see the abomination of desolation, uh, you'll, also, you'll also note here in, in verse uh, uh, 15, the, the audience, audience reference, when you see the abomination of of, of, of uh, desolation. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. And so there's the audience relevance of what's going on here. I mean, then you get to, to uh, later after verse 15, and Jesus says, this is what you need to do. Uh, when you see the abomination standing where it, where it ought not to stand, and he makes a reference to the book of Daniel, uh, Luke says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, Flee to the hills. Go to the, go to the hillside. Go go to the hills like Lot and his wife were supposed to go to the hills, uh, and don't look back like Lot's wife did. Uh, don't go into the, your house and get your your uh, uh, cloak. Uh, you know, if you're on your on your roof, you know, get out of town. Uh, pray that your your flight doesn't take place in the winter because it's going to be hard. Uh, pray that you're you're not with child in, in, in those days. And you so here you got the audience reference of you when you see these things, when you see the abomination, and then you see a lo local local judgment. Uh, we're not seeing we're not uh, we're not being uh, taken into a global. Uh, Oh no. Hey, Dad. It's the rapture. No joke. <laughs> Gary, if you can hear me, you froze. You might need to um, leave and then come right back through that link. Technology. <clears throat> that was an intentional potty break for everyone. I think that that's where it was the rapture. He went for it. Yeah. might have to go get a whiskey for medicinal purposes. <laughs> go for it. Let me see if I can uh, send him a quick note. Yes, I hope. Hey, Gary. You back on? Yes, sir. Where did I leave off? You. We all thought that you got raptured. Uh... <laughs> Global was your last word. What's that? Global was your last oh, okay. word. Okay, so okay, so you didn't miss you didn't miss much. So the. Keeping all of these things in mind, you know, um, letting the Bible interpret itself, comparing Scripture with Scripture, letting the Old Testament uh, uh, help with interpretation of. Uh, ah. Are you still there? Yes, go ahead, Gary. Okay. Uh, keeping all of those things in mind and looking at the context, the audience, relevance, uh, uh, the, the the original language behind a lot of these words, 
you, you get some idea, this is how you, you, you approach all of this. And you don't need to be a Bible, Bible scholar to do this. This really just takes practice, like with anything. This was one of um, the writer of the Hebrews, you know, with, we, with practice, we have our senses trained to discern good and evil. Well, with practice, we get better at, at doing these sorts of things. So I get, I've covered probably about 30 minutes worth of stuff. Are there, are there any questions at, at this point? Comments or questions? All right, everybody's unmuted. Anybody have any questions for uh, for Gary? Uh, what, who's this? Y'all seeing what I'm seeing? I don't know. What are you seeing? I see some guy in a MAGA hat. Oh, no, it's not a MAGA hat. It's, it's make church great again. Oh. <laughs> yeah, if anybody, if anybody makes uh, talks with their microphone off, their picture pops up. Oh, I see. Okay. So any questions? Yeah, I have a question. I've got uh, a couple. Um, okay. And uh, Gary, uh, as uh, pretty much everyone knows, I'm, I'm like the loyal opposition. Uh, not, uh, definitely not pre-millennial, but amillennial. Okay. Uh, but I do, uh, one question I have is going back to the pre-millennial battles you were having. Uh, tell me what were you doing and what are you doing now rel relative to Seventh-day Adventists and the approaches uh, they take? Probably nothing. What, what in particular with Seventh-day Adventists? I'm, I'm just saying, you know, they're very pre-millennial. They're very, especially with the, with the uh, virus they've been you know, uh, oh boy, this is it sort of deal. Um, uh, anything about them in particular that, that uh, you know, three bullet points would make the most effective with Seventh-day Adventists? Well, the first, you know, the, the first thing I always, I always deal with with them, I said, you know, the same thing was said about every plague, every virus, every war, every earthquake, uh, you name it. Uh, it's 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 been done before. I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses very much like the Seventh Day Adventists on the same thing. I mean, when they come knocking on your door, you have to remember that the the Seventh Day Adventists started out as a millennial cult. Uh, uh, William Miller made very specific um, reference to a particular day. I mean, they literally went up on a on a mountaintop. His 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 followers. So they are, a, they are an end time millennial uh, cult, if you will. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were originally called Millennial Dawn. Uh, the Mormons, Latter Day Saints. So their, their arguments are generally the, the, the same. They may have a, uh, I, don't think, I don't think the Seventh Day Adventists, I don't even know if they have a rapture position at all. I don't think it's, if, if they do, I don't, think it's like the dispensationalists who have a preacher of rapture because you have to keep Israel and the church separate from, you know, from, from one another. Uh, but I said, look, where, where in history uh, do we find similar type arguments like this, the, the plagues and so forth? I mean, you can go all the way through history. We, have, we published a book uh, a number of years ago called The Day and the Hour, where it's 2,000 years of the same, same types of things. You have Islam, you have Islam going all the way back. If you go back to the Reformation, you have, you have two fundamental candidates who were considered to be the Antichrist, the end time, maybe one, uh, one you know, going ahead and the other one down, down the, the historical road, and that was the Turks, the, the Islam, and the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, so, Historically, this isn't new. Uh, what you what you would have to find within uh, within the Jehovah's Witnesses, within Seventh Day Adventists, and, and any anyone else doing that is that what would be the trigger element that would say what's taking place today is different from what took place uh, during World War II. Uh, during World War I, the time period between uh, uh, World War I and World War II, where Mussolini was thought to be the Antichrist. Oswald J. Smith came out with a book in the 1920s saying he was the Antichrist. All the, all the prophecies that are being used today were being used for Mussolini. Hitler, I mean, Hitler was a big, big Antichrist. 
Um, and the Roman Catholic Church uh, was, of course, the Antichrist in the uh, Presbyterian Church. It was actually written into the, 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 uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith. They later changed it, uh, not identifying the papacy as the Antichrist. So I would, I would just say, what, what's the trigger element? What's different about today? Uh, the dispensationalist would say that Israel becoming a nation again was prophetically significant as a time indicator that the prophecy clocks started back up again. But that's a that's an old argument that doesn't work anymore. Uh, because now you got to change the the uh, the length of a generation from 40 years because we passed 1988 what was that uh, 30 32 years ago uh, and uh, you can't even get to uh, well this would be the was it the 70th 70th year uh, if it doesn't happen now when then, then you have to move to 100 years so I think you just have to say, what is the triggering element right now? And once I knew what the triggering element was, then I could, an I could answer that particular question. Sure. And then very short, uh, a different one. Going to the uh, KJV translation of the, of the Texas Receptus. Why, I, I hear your argument, but why did the, do you think the KJV translators took a word like aeon and said world or, or the other, uh, I mean, and I'm just curious what the why, I mean, I could flesh that out, but I'm, I'm just curious yeah, what, I, why I, do you think they did that? I think that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and what's interesting about the, the King James Version, a lot of people don't know this, but the, King James had a lot of uh, oversight in terms of how the it was going to be translated. Um, in, in fact, it's interesting that the Greek word uh, ecclesia is translated church, where Tyndale's translation translated it as congregation or assembly. And that was that was anathema. In fact, it was one of the one of the four translation reasons that uh, uh, Tyndale was burned at the stake because he, he translated uh, ecclesia as congregation or assembly and took the ecclesiastical formulation of the church away from the, the, the priests and the, and the uh, religious hierarchy. But they did the same thing with, with, bish with bishops, with, with the word uh, uh, presbyteros, rather than pres one, instead of Presbyterian. And I forget what the other, what the other two were. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. In fact, I, I, Maybe that's something to do research research on why they why they translated it that way. It makes no sense, and I, I haven't really done I really haven't done a a study to see if they translate aeon any other way anywhere else in the New Testament. I, I probably need to do that. I, they do the same thing in. Uh, it, let me just say this: May, maybe it's maybe they didn't have a good word to use. And, and world can mean uh, something local, our world, Thomas Jefferson's world, George Washington's world. And, you know, that, that's not unusual. Um, if you get to Luke 2, 1, it says that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, this is the King James, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world be taxed. And I, I bet you every preacher has ever preached on that passage explains that what this means is the world of the Romans. Uh, so I don't think it's, I, I, I can use the King James to make that case. Uh, it's just easier for me to say, hey, look, this word is behind it. Uh, and, and, and in fact, if you talk to a dispensationalist, it's obvious as Matthew 24 is not talking about the end of the world. It's talking about the end of a particular generation and following that is going to be a thousand year a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. So they can't even interpret that as world because the world keeps going on for another thousand years. And it's a, and, and Jesus is is um, in verse thirty four. He says this generation will not, not pass away until all these things take place. And they see that generation as the generation uh, uh, um, prior to <clears throat> the seven year tribulation period and then the thousand years. So even they don't translate it as the end of the world or interpret it as the end of the world. That's a good question. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do more research on that and see what I can find. Okay, thank you, Gary, appreciate it. You're welcome.
Hey Gary, I, I have a, a question for you. You mentioned the, um, the, the f talking about your eschatological point of view of being uh, a partial preterist. And um, I was just curious, could you define that? And then is there, is there an error on the going too far with that where you completely do away with any future um, any future prophecy in the Bible uh, for us today or a kind of an, uh, a situation in which the world does end in some sense um, or maybe the entire uh, uh, system ends in some sense? Um, that's a good question. The, the word preterist, in fact, uh, Charles Spurgeon when he, on his section on commentaries, uh, commenting and commentaries, uh, if you can find a copy of that book, it's very, it's very, very good. And he has a short definition of preterism, uh, which is obviously means in the 19th century, uh, a preterist interpretation of the book of Revelation was, well, well, was, was, was available, was around. And a preterist, is just someone someone who believes that when a prophecy is given and then is later fulfilled the fulfillment means it's in the past and that's what the word preterist means so every every christian is a preterist uh they're all the prophecies in the old testament leading up to jesus's life death uh, resurrection and ascension all those prophecies being fulfilled makes us preterists on the first coming of christ because those, the fulfillment is in our past and actually in the past of the New Testament. So that's not unusual. Uh, there are a number of prophecies in the New Testament uh, that uh, there's some debate on as to whether they refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 or, the, or whether there's a dual fulfillment. A lot of people say Matthew chapter 24 is uh, going to, it's going to recapitulate, it's going to happen again. There's nothing in the text that seems to indicate that. John Murray, uh, who was a Reformed scholar, has a commentary in Matthew 24 and 25, and he sees it as a mix. Some things refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Some things refer to the, se to the second coming. Uh, Marcellus Kick divided Matthew 24 at verse 35. Everything up through verse 35 referred to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. After verse 35, verse 36 and following, uh, ref referred to the second coming. And so the, the, the debate is which passages in the New Testament refer to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, that is a preterist interpretation, and then what verses refer to a uh, future coming of, of Jesus' physical resurrection and things of that sort. Um, I identify, the, the easiest ones to identify is, is there, if there is a time indicator involved. Um, Matthew chapter 20, Matthew 16, 27 and 28, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I believe that refers to the, to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Uh, not everyone was dead by that, that time, uh, but some, were, some in fact were, were, were still alive. Um, and it's pretty fanciful, although there's some people who believe this, that there's still somebody still alive in the world today uh, based upon John chapter 22. In fact, there's a, I have a book where the guy actually says the, the apostle John is alive somewhere in some cave. I mean, that's really taking things to extreme. I just don't think it's necessary. Matthew 10, 23 says, you will not finish going through the, to the cities of Israel until the son of man comes. Uh, so again, that there, that's a time indicator. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. This generation, if you look, if you compare scripture with scripture in the gospel, especially in gospel of Matthew, this generation refers to the generation to whom Jesus is speaking. Words like near and shortly and quickly, uh, I believe, refer to events related to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Um, so that that's that's kind of the preterist interpretation in a nutshell, and the what you look for, and at, at least to identify things related to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD seventy. Um, and Marcellus Kick is probably a good pattern of that because it's, his is the most basic. It gets much more complicated 
when you're looking at other passages. I mean, the book of Revelation, how much of it refers to, uh, does it refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70? There you're dealing with dating issues. It was the book of Revelation written after the destruction of Jerusalem. Was it written before, uh, near, shortly? The temple is still standing in chapter 11, those kinds of things. And so if you're, which, what things are left, possibly, uh, some say Acts chapter 1, Jesus will return in the same way that he was taken up. Uh, but people interpret that in different ways. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is probably the, the one that is uh, probably relates to the, the, the end time, a, a general resurrection. Uh, in gener in, in 1, Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, um, you know, that's, that's the favorite rapture passage. Uh, the, you know, the Lord himself will descend, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but that's, there's some debate there. But those are probably the three big ones that people who are not full preterists use uh, to demonstrate that there is a, um, what I call a consummating coming. Some would say Second Peter chapter 3, the new heavens and the new earth. And yet someone like John Lightfoot and John Owen said, no, no, that doesn't have anything to do with the end of the world. It has to, this, is a, this is a prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, the idea of fire. Jesus mentions that in, in Matthew chapter 22. Who are the mockers? Uh, I believe that the mockers in Second, in second Peter chapter 3 are those who are mocking uh, the Christians uh, who claim that the temple was going to be destroyed before their generation passed away. Here it was probably, if, if Peter was writing around mid-60s, the temple was still standing. In fact, it looked more glorious than it ever looked before. It was a, it was a literally rebuilt temple, uh, and it was still standing. And so, oh, you said that the, 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 this generation would not pass away and all these things take place. Well, this generation is about to pass away, and the temple is still standing. Well, a few years later, not one stone was left upon another. So it's a debate that, that is, is going on, um, and there are some passages, I, I, to be honest, I don't have an answer for. Revelation 20 is still an enigma to me. It's a difficult path, a section of scripture, um, and you know, I, don't have to have, I don't have to have all the answers. Uh, but what's interesting on the millennial question, Jay Adams, for example, uh, it was a, is a partial preterist, but he's all millennial. Uh, so the millennial, the millennial issue isn't necessarily tied to the preterist argument, uh, except probably with um, premillennialism. But there are some premillennialists who see Matthew 24 as referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's the, it's the reason if you pick up a systematic theology, it's the last section of the book because it's probably the one place where there has been more debate uh, than on any other on, than any other any other topic. I mean, there's of course debate between Calvinists and Arminians and so forth. But eschatology, there are so many variant views uh, that it's hard to keep hard to keep track of them. Any anything else, Gary? On the uh, you mentioned the principle of uh, contextuality and content of the text. I want you to just comment, if you will, Gary, on why it's so difficult for modern Americans to look at the text in its first century context. Why is there such a tendency in our day to, uh, to, to postpone everything? Um, but what I'm asking, I guess I'm asking, what's the psychology behind that? Uh, I, think the psych I think the psychology is... Number one, it's a position they've held for so long, and some of their favorite people preach it. And come on, you, you, how could you say that those guys could be wrong about this? I mean, John MacArthur, you know, John MacArthur is wrong, is, is wrong about this. Um, uh, so I, th I think that's, that's it. I mean, who is this young whippersnapper coming up and saying that he's wrong, even though I'm 70 years old? So it's kind of, I'm no, I'm no young whippersnapper anymore. Um, so, I don't know if we're losing this signal. Not again. He's been raptured three times. This is like no, a no, no, post-trib no, rap. 
That's that's John MacArthur's spies. It's the curse of MacArthur. <laughs> He's been hacked. Ah. Gary's ability to uh, state facts about the church history and detail is fascinating. He has literally, um, the last time I talked to him, he has a, a library that is one of the most elaborate libraries in eschatology in the world. Virtually every book written on the end times of whatever position he has a possession of. Oh, let's see if he comes back there. Uh, there you go, Gary. You're good. I keep, for some reason, I keep getting knocked off the internet. So I don't know what the problem is uh, other than that. So, uh, so I think that's part of it. And I think the other is it's, it's, uh, it's a little scary to give, to give up a position uh, that you've held for so long. And there are so many other doctrines attached to it. If I'm wrong yeah. about this and what else am I wrong about? Um, yeah. There could be a, there could be another reason is that if, if they're wrong and there's another position out there, um, it makes me much more responsible for the world in which we live. I mean, mm. you combine all of that, and that's kind of a witch's brew. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I, I tell you, I, I get emails from people every day, and it's no exaggeration, how transformational uh, this has, has, has been for people. Uh, they've had more children. They send their kids to school. <laughs> They're more optimistic. They 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 don't they don't have heart palpitations when they see something happening in the world. Not that they dismiss those things, and I'm not dismissing any of these. I think this thing with the virus is 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 a is a terrible terrible thing, but there's more to it than that. Uh, the history behind it, plus what are the political ramifications, and what if there isn't a rapture, and what if you aren't going to be taken out of this world. Uh, what if we're, we're going to be left here for another 100 years or 200 years? Uh, the, the, the ramifications of what the government can do uh, you know, to us is extremely important. And if we as Christians don't think we should be involved out of eschatological reasons and, and other types of reasons, uh, the church is becoming irrelevant. I don't know if you've seen this article that this, uh, uh, somebody had written for Harvard Magazine. Uh, did, you see, did you see that in the last couple of days? And about yes, there, there's this big meeting taking place. It's supposed to take place. Probably it's going to be at a distance like what we're doing here. And uh, Robert, uh, 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 I guess it's Reich, uh, is involved in this. And this Harvard professor is saying that essentially homeschooling should be outlawed or so supervised oh. that you have to, um, you have to, you know, go along with everything the state has to say about all this thing. And they. they and people say, well, homeschooling is not a big deal. Then they'll go after the private schools in the same way. Well, okay, let's, let's assume that I'm right and they're wrong about the rapture and uh, this happens and you're not rescued, then what are you going to do? So there, there are all kinds of implications to this. And I think it's scary for a lot of people. They'd, like, they'd rather be raptured. And I see the comments online when I'll publish something. You know, Jesus is coming soon, you know, ready to go beam me up and all that kind of stuff so you know it has it has implications <laughs> go hey, ahead gary. mr franzone hey gary this is jonathan franzone yes sir uh, i first of all i really enjoyed the debate that you did with kent hoven it was a pleasure you were the guys you were sitting in the front row with some of your kids is that right yeah <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't you know when you were down there i couldn't tell I couldn't tell what side you were on. You were playing. You were playing the straight man the whole time, and I, that was that was really that was pretty good. <laughs> uh, my question is: My former pastor, one of the arguments that he gave for holding to a premillennial position was that in the book of Ezekiel, he goes through such painstaking detail in measuring out the temple. Um, what would your response be to that argument? Uh, the first thing I would I would the first question I would ask is who's measuring the temple? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in book in the in the book of Revelation, John measures the temple, and that's because John's measuring the temple. It's one of the evidences for me that that temple is still standing. Now, this is a vision that's taking place, and in Ezekiel, it's it's a vision too. 
Uh, but Ezekiel is not the one measuring the temple. Someone else is measuring the temple. So I think that's kind of an indication that this is a vision. And the second thing is there's nothing in those chapters that says that the te that temple is to be built, which is kind of curious. Now, the sanctuary is supposed to be built, but not the, not the temple itself. And I, I just, I have to ask the dimensions of that temple, where is this temple go going to be? I mean, the size of it is absolutely enormous. Um, and it, so th th then, then the, other, the other question is, are you telling me that in this temple, and by the way, Revelation chapter 20 doesn't talk anything about a rebuilt temple, which is kind of interesting. There's nothing in the book of Revelation about Jesus reigning on the earth. And the ones who reign with him have been beheaded. Now, it seems to me if they're beheaded, they're with Jesus to live as Christ, to die as gain. So there are lots of other elements to this. Uh, but if you, if you read the Ezekiel, you know, beginning of chapter 40 and go on, it says that these sacrifices are for atonement. So what does that mean? It means that... Very, come back one more time. This might be the sign of uh, the end of things. This is our <laughs> astrological sign. I'm enjoying it so much. I am. Uh, he is on a roll, and I'm just uh, like just two more hours, Gary. It's a good place to end it. Yeah. What does it mean? It means dot dot dot. Optimistic note. Sorry, Jim. Optimistic note. I'm the most optimistic a millennial you'll ever find. Jim, you are you are so close to the kingdom, brother. <laughs> Almost there. Uh, Gary, go ahead, brother. Okay. So, what did I finish? What did you hear? What was the last thing you heard? We thought you left us with a cliffhanger, so you're just there. <laughs> um, I don't know where I left off, but the one I think the last place I left off was is that. The, you would have to require, it would have to require that sacrifices for atonement yes. would be have to, would have to take place during that that time that Jesus is supposedly reigning on the earth, and uh, and they'll say, well, they were for memorial, and well, even that's crazy. I mean, come on. Uh, and Hebrews chapter nine is very clear, uh, very very clear that that's just unnecessary. But to say that they're for atonement. So I think what what um, is happening here it's it's a vision. It's a, it's it, that vision is 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 no different. Well, it's little different from what you find in the book of, book of Revelation. You, here you have uh, uh, Revelation chapter six. You have the the, the, the stars are thrown down to the uh, uh, to the earth, and yet in chapter thirteen we're going to have uh, uh, microchips in, inserted into us. <laughs> How's that going to work? You just destroyed the earth in chapter 6. And in chapter 12, with any stars that are left, there's a dragon that throws a third of the stars down to the earth. So it's, it's a vision. Uh, you, you find that, that John is taken up, taken up into heaven and he's, he's seeing a vision. This is, I don't think Ezekiel 40 and, 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 and following is anything different from that. It's talking about the, I believe, the kind of the, the glories of the post-exilic period. And it's, it's a prelude to what's going to come, where you find in, in, in John chapter 2, I mean, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it back up again. This, this, I, I, that is old, that's old covenant language that has nothing to do with, uh, with, 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 the, new, with the new covenant. So, and it's just, uh, I, I just, I know premillennialism, they think they're interpreting the Bible literally, Revelation 20, literally, someone says, Oh, but um, the thousand years is mentioned, was it six times? I said, well, what that means is, is that whatever it means, it means that six times. Uh, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean that's a, literally a thousand years, because I think the, la the lamb is mentioned, what, 20 times in the book of 
in, in the book of Reve in the book of Revelation. So are we talking about a real lamb here? And then you've got the mark the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter thirteen. And then you have the name of the the uh, name of the lamb and his father written on you. So there's to use the book of Revelation in a way to say this is all literal. No one does that. And I think Ezekiel 40 is, is simply, it, it's a vision. I think if, if, if um, Ezekiel maybe had measured it, it might be different, but he's not the guy who measured it. He's seen a vision. This yeah. isn't something man is going to build. Hmm. Has anyone who has not asked a question, uh, would you like to ask a question now? Um, I have one. So we find that a lot of um, prophecy, I think, has you know, dual fulfillments. Um, you know, we might see one fulfillment and then another fulfillment um, in, in a different way. Um, how, how do you see that in terms of the, the predator's view and, and the things that you've been talking about? Now, that's a good question. Uh, the first question I would ask, uh, where is there a dual fulfillment? Uh, where is one prophecy given and it it's, has, has a, a dual fulfillment? That'd be the first question. So I'd have to answer something particular. It doesn't seem like there's anything in Matthew 24 that indicates that this is this is all going to take place again. Um, you would need another you would need a, another temple, and yet the New Testament doesn't say anything about a rebuilt temple. Uh, the 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 other the other thing is that I think what um, I think what people confuse is application of of something is different from a, a dual fulfillment of something. Uh, if, if, if I'm reading a prophecy that has already been fulfilled, I can make application to it. And in fact, I think that's what the book of Revelation is all about. Why was the book of Revelation written? Uh, notice that it was written to seven churches that existed at that period of time. And you'll note that there was a warning to those, to some of those churches. In fact, you will see in three of those warnings, there's a threat to come in judgment of some, of, of, of some kind. So when you read Matthew chapter 24, you say, oh man, we're off the hook. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to worry about anything. And uh, that's, that's just not the case. So I think we just have to be careful that, you know, does it, give me an example of a double fulfillment. And number two, where in the text does it say that there is a, a double fulfillment? And I would add the third one, Maybe it could be three or four or five or six fulfillments. Um, so you have to take all that into consideration. And I don't see anything in Matthew 24, or Mark 12, or Mark 13, or Luke, 30, uh, Luke 21 that this is indicating a double fulfillment. Now, I had mentioned John Murray. Uh, he sees a, a mix. He sees some things referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and then some things refer to the, the, the uh, consummating coming. I deal with him in a book I wrote called... Uh, um, prophecy wars. And I'll probably have to reprint that somewhere else because that book is is out of print. Uh, so I don't know when you how where you stop with how many dual, tri, quad, you know, fulfillments you get. The, it's, the it's difficulty. Kind of guessing, it's kind of a guessing game. It's kind of a guessing game. If there is if something is full, if so, uh, you know, if there's something that's happened in the Old Testament that's repeated in the New Testament, that's generally viewed as a type of anti-type. It's not right. a dual fulfillment. It's simply, this is the, you know, the, the uh, um, serpent that was, you know, set up in the wilderness. Well, that's a type, Jesus is the anti-type. You got Jonah, type, Jesus, anti-type. Uh, those types of things aren't, aren't what, what we would call a dual fulfillment. One of the one of the uh, answers, one of the additional answer to that, Gary, is that um, the specificity of the text is just remarkable. And you have, if you're interested in outside sources, you have Josephus who confirmed these details. But you get something like in Luke 21, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know the desolation has come near. I mean, the specificity of Matthew 24, of Mark 13, Luke 21 has a first century flavor that is very hard to replicate in the 21st century context. When you're a woman pregnant, don't go up in the hills. You know, you, there, there's a fear that is very specific to a contextual 
uh, desert, thirsty kind of environment that would be very difficult to be replicated in another time frame, especially in the age of, of, uh, of fast access and globalization that we live in today. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Uh, uh, the Sabbath was still in effect. Right, the Old Testament you know, Sabbath, yeah. Take place during the Sabbath. Uh, not being pregnant, uh, very interesting. Luke mentions this a, a little bit, and you read Josephus. I mean, there's that horrible story of that woman uh, who the Roman soldiers come in and find that, you know, she has, her baby is dead and, you know, because of the famine that's taking, you know, taking place that's there, uh, she's cooking her, her child. I mean, Josephus tells this story. And by the way, the, the famine, if you look at Acts chapter 11, you'll see that there was a famine all over the Oikumene during the reign of Claudius. Uh, false prophets, you'll see, you know, uh, John chapter 4, uh, chapter 1, you've got uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. You're right, this is, this is very local. This, would it, otherwise, would we all have to go to Judea and flee to the mountains outside of Judea? But, you know, that just, that just doesn't make sense. You could, you, could, you could escape this on foot. I mean, that's how simple it was to escape this. You could leave Jerusalem, go outside to the mountains of Judea and hide, and you would have been okay. You, you huh. can't apply that to today. Right. All right, one final question here, please, from anyone or any comments, anything? Well, I'll take it if nobody's going to take it. Um, it, it second, so what is... Nobody the, surprised you. It, it, so... The second coming. What is the second coming? Is it, has it already occurred or has it not occurred? How do you view it? Well, I mean, tradi traditionally, the second coming is Jesus comes again at the end of history. Right. Uh, the, that's, I mean, if you basically look at the proof texts on that, you'll see First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, I think it is. Uh, that's, that was the second coming. The first... Um, uh, Jesus must reign until he puts all of his enemies under his feet. So we're looking at 1 Corinthians 15, and they say they would say that's that's part of the second coming as well. Uh, Acts chapter one. Uh, but you know what's interesting? You don't get a lot of specificity on what all of that means. I mean, what? How is that going to manifest itself? There's very very little detail on that. Although there's very there's a great amount of detail on the events that were to happen, transpire before that generation passed away, for the time was near. But on the, on the, the, the second coming, uh, if, if you look at the proof text in the Westminster Confession of Faith, a lot of, a lot of the passages that I believe were, were, were uh, preterously interpreted, they, they apply those to the, to the second coming. Uh, but there isn't a lot of information on what that's going to be like. The same thing about heaven. There's not a lot of information on what heaven is going to be like. It's, heaven is, is, seems to be described in very metaphorical uh, ways. You look at the book of, book of Revelation, um, it's, there's not a whole lot. Uh, every tear will be wiped away, okay, but what's it going to be like? I mean, is there going to be any competition in heaven? I mean, will there be sports in heaven? You know, people say, well, you know, do, do our, will we see our pets in heaven? Uh, there is a thing about, you know, marriage. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot of detail on the distant future aspect of all of this. All right, Gary DeMar, go ahead, Jim, finish it. No, I just said thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. Gary, thanks for your time, my brother. I uh, really appreciate having you. It was good to see you a couple months ago, and uh, our congregation is really uh, privileged to have you come and, and teach us this evening. Have thank you, you my uh, friend. You heard any more about Jim? How he how he's doing? Uh, Jim is Jim is frail, um, but uh, he has a, a really great support there at Trinity Presbyterian. And um, uh, Doug kind of comes and goes. That's his, his youngest son. He comes right. and goes, and they've had a lot of um, a lot of family in uh, uh, family from Brenda. So Jim is doing you know okay, but um, he's going to need a lot of support. I think. Not just emotional, but uh, physical in the next uh, years to come. 
I need to go over there and talk to him about some physical physical stuff. Uh, <laughs> because do you know Mark Horn? You yeah, know, absolutely. I mean, Mark had a stroke, and he yeah. started he started doing you know weight weight training to get you know, get the muscles and, and things you know strengthen up a bit. So yeah, Mark is a miracle case yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I did well. Do yeah. By the way, for those of you um, like um, Al Stout getting up there in age, he's the man to model, brother. <laughs> Seventy years old, Gary. Yeah, I got, I'm. 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 I'm hoping. The, uh, I, I've competed in Masters track and field, and uh, the I, because I'm 70 now, the shot put is only 8.8 .8 pounds, and so <laughs> I, I can't. I couldn't. I can't wait. Uh, I don't know if they're going to have a meet this year, but I. I went out and threw a little bit today, and so I'm. Um, um, that it, it does give me some incentive to to stay to stay in shape. So we'll see I need to happens. tell my father about that. Who's uh, who was a, a track and field guy, shot put hammer thrower in, in college. Really? Yeah. A while ago. How old is he? He's eighty. He's eighty three. Yeah. He, yeah. There are eighty year olds and ninety year olds there. It's really yeah. something. Uh, he'd love that. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Gary. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks so much.